Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dry Dock episode 15. I apologise in advance for any slight changes to my voice that you might experience in this week's episode. However, I am doing this through at least one possibly more cracked ribs, and yes, they hurt. Anyway, on with the questions. 34 Powers asks a two-part question. First, what would be the norm of armour in percentage on a ship's displacement? Well, that's variable, and it's not really that much of a useful metric on how effective the ship's armour is going to be. On a battle cruiser, for example, in the run-up to World War I, it was anything of 20 to 25% of the ship's displacement. Um, Whereas for a battleship, it started out with the earlier dreadnoughts at maybe 25% of the ship's displacement. By the end of the uh, the First World War, that had gone up to maybe 30% of the ship's displacement, give or take a little bit. But most ships you would find would be in that ballpark, plus or minus maybe 2 or 3%. Once you get through into the 1930s and the World War II period, that goes up again. So you have ships like the North Carolina class and the Bismarck class with around 40% of their total weight given over to protection. But at the same time, the Yamato is wandering around and it's only, well, only devoting about a third of its displacement to armour, about just around 33%, give or take a bit. So basically, it's more and more displacement devoted to armour as time goes on, unless you get a really big jump, in which case the much larger ship, thanks to the square cube law, can get a lot more armour on for a less percentage of its displacement. The second part of his question is... With Bismarck, considering she lost some buoyancy when Prince of Wales hit her fuel tanks and with the various torpedo hits she suffered subsequently, how likely is it that a lot of the hits she suffered on her hull above the waterline were actually underwater before her crew could have scuttled her? Well, she was definitely going down slowly, and as you can see from the various diagrams that were drawn of the hits scored, there were a certain number of impacts that were either at just above or fractionally below the normal water line. So a lot of those would have been underwater by the time the battle finished. And uh, as basically anyone who's examined the wreck in detail and most of the historians who have reviewed things, and to be honest, even most of the crew themselves will admit, the whether or not the Bismarck was scuttled basically doesn't change the overall outcome of things. It was going down. It was just a matter of time as to when. Um, If the ship was scuttled, uh, then that accelerated the process. But one way or another, that ship was heading for the bottom. Kaiser asks, were there any Japanese cruisers that could stand a chance against the American or British heavy cruisers? Well, on paper, the Miyoko, Takao and Megamis, once they'd been rearmed, all in theory have a fairly good chance. They are all pretty quick, they've all got good torpedo armament, and they all have 10 8-inch guns uh, in in their five twin turrets. Um, So in actual fact, in terms of pure gun barrels, they actually um, outgun pretty much any British or American heavy cruiser of the period, since most of those would have either 8 or 9 8-inch guns. And their fire control optics were pretty good. Um, But they did suffer from problems, especially with the Megamis, of being effectively ships that were trying to squeeze a bit too much into the displacement, which is the perennial problem with the 10,000 ton weight limit on the treaty cruisers. And albeit that the Japanese in the end did kind of basically just give up and started cheating their way blatantly around the treaty limits, um, their ships still did suffer from this sort of slightly uh, slightly too lightly built um, problem. And the torpedo armament, whilst it could be very effective, as a number of American heavy cruisers would find out to their cost early in the war, it was also a weakness for the Japanese ships, as you had uh, a number of them would be either crippled or fatally damaged by hits that otherwise shouldn't have sunk them, detonating the torpedoes in their launchers. So, yeah, if you take, say, a New Orleans class or a a Baltimore class or a county class and you put them up against uh, a Japanese equivalent in a straight gunfight on paper the Japanese cruisers have uh, a a decent chance Uh, with their torpedo armament again on paper they have a very 
decent chance because uh, the British and American cruisers are highly unlikely to expect uh, the kind of long-range, reasonably stealthy torpedo attack that they the Japanese could put out. But the flip side to that is that the Japanese ships are significantly more vulnerable to actually taking damage, um, both overall and in terms of having the torpedoes on deck if they haven't already launched them. Alfredo Sierra asks, why did uh, Qing and China never try to expand their navy with larger and better ships during their lifetime? Well, the answer is they tried to an extent. Uh, Both Japan and China had rather rude awakenings to the power of technologically advanced Western nations. For Japan, it was the arrival of the US Navy squadron that forced open some of their ports, as well as other incidents um, with various European colonial powers. And for the Chinese, rather unsurprisingly, it was the First and Second Opium Wars, where you saw one of the largest countries on the planet effectively beaten into submission by to a large extent, the East India Corporation, or East India Company, rather than the British Empire itself, um, although they did get involved uh, later on in the wars. Now, the Japanese response to that was to go into crash modernization program, and that would eventually lead to uh, things like the Battle of Tsushima, but before that, it would lead to, in part, the First and Second Sino-Japanese Wars, and this is where the responses to uh, the uh, realisation of Western technical superiority came into full effect. Because in China, they had their own version of the the Japanese efforts to modernise, and this was called the self-strengthening movement. However, where the Japanese approach was basically, okay, we're technologically inferior, we're going to buy in as much modern technology as we can, learn from it, adapt it to our uses, and then eventually work out how to build it for ourselves, which ultimately would work out relatively successfully. Much of what made up China's political landscape was still wedded to the Confucian idea that China was the centre of the universe, China was superior to everybody, they had the mandate of heaven, blah blah blah, and so they were not interested so much in buying outright Western technology as much as basically getting their hands on a little bit of it and then jumping straight into the we'll do it ourselves. So whereas the Japanese would just go, okay, well, we need an army equipped with rifles, we'll buy a ton of rifles, the Chinese went, we'll buy like a case of rifles and then tell our own people to manufacture them ourselves and the same with ships they tried to build their own warships and as it turned out trying to basically tell a bunch of people who hadn't quite been through an industrial revolution to produce modern breech loading rifles and steam powered iron hulled warships went about as well as you could expect Um, the products in question ended up being vastly more expensive and vastly inferior to the originals That's not to say their efforts were complete failures. Um, There were a number of Chinese officials who were acutely aware of what they actually needed to do to modernise their military forces, and they did have some success, especially on land. However, due to the various political clashes involved over the ideas of how to modernise China, and a lot of corruption that managed to worm its way into the efforts, their naval efforts were significantly less successful. But ironically, after the Chinese armed forces have begun to be equipped more and more with the stuff that had just been straight out bought from the West, including uh, ironclad battleships, uh, factionalism and corruption basically spelled the end of what should have been a vastly more powerful uh, force than it actually was when it came to battle. For example, um, the Chinese actually had four navies that they modernised, four entire fleets, But the factionalism was so bad that one of them refused to participate in a war with the French and one of its compatriot fleets then, in retaliation, refused to cooperate and deploy in the first Sino-Japanese war. And you can imagine um, just how absurd the idea of uh, your various fleets refusing to help each other in a sort of tit-for-tat grudge match settling, but there you go, that's how it was. And the corruption issues meant that when it actually came to the Battle of the Yalu River, which was the biggest confrontation between the Japanese and Chinese fleets of the period, um, the Chinese uh, 
crew had an unenviable task of trying to sort out which of their gunpowder charges had been stolen and replaced by bags of cereals and which of their shells actually still had explosives in them and which ones had been replaced with fillings of porcelain or cement in peacetime so that corrupt officials could sell off uh, the various explosives for profit. With all that said, they did fight very hard, um, but it just wasn't enough for reasons that should be fairly obvious. And after that, the Chinese emperor at the time just wasn't that interested in the military and decided he was going to spend the money better on relieving a bunch of natural disasters that happened towards the end of the 19th century. And China was then basically left behind by Japan and the other regional powers who obviously, without having a whole load of their ships sunk, were able to move on to bigger and better things. Ross Venner asks, um, he says, greatly enjoyed the discussion of the compromises in gun and gun house selections. This was a, a few dry docks ago. Um, as a follow on, what was the relative efficiency of large guns in double, triple and quadruple arrangements? Did twins fire faster than triples and quads? Uh, what about drill failures, etc.? To a certain degree, we did actually talk about similar issues in the previous dry dock episode. Um, but to go over it again, um, a bit more specific to this question, yes, basically, uh, in most cases, twin mountings were more efficient and reliable and therefore usually could fire slightly faster than triples or quads, uh, given the same level of technology and uh, other factors like ammo supply. Obviously, if you could make a triple or a quad turret that had the same kind of relative internal volume space devoted to each gun as a twin, then you could get uh, past those issues, but then at the same time, you would be obviating a lot of the space and weight savings that you could gain by using a triple turret in the first place, and would be making your ship a lot wider, which would in turn mean either you'd have to make the ship longer and therefore overall much bigger and much more expensive, um, or you'd end up with a slower ship. And there was always the perennial risk that if something went wrong with one gun, you risked losing more of your main armament in a triple or a quad than you did with a twin. Um, and as we mentioned in the videos on the French uh, Treaty and uh, World War II era ships, their quad turrets very specifically were effectively built as a pair of twins with a bulkhead between them specifically to try and avoid that uh, from happening. So basically right up until sort of the 1940s when technology advanced enough to make the triple turret um, the superior choice in pretty much all respects, but basically up until then if you wanted a, a quick firing and efficient gun turret then yeah you wanted to go with a double. Um, if but if you had space and weight requirements to think of, then you would go for a triple or a quad, uh, depending on exactly what caliber of gun you had relative to the size of your ship and how pressing those other issues were. Tamenga88 has quite an involved question. He says, uh, Yuzuru Hiraga's Congo and Fuso replacement battleship proposals in the late 1920s, could they have even have been realistically implemented? So we're talking about uh, 10 410mm guns and 160,000 shaft horsepower on a Washington Naval Treaty hull of 35,000 tonnes. And being treaty battleship designs, why were they never built? Well, going with the last bit first, uh, as for why they were never built, basically costs uh, and the relative strength and position of the Japanese Navy. Remember, they'd effectively been limited to 10 capital ships uh, by the treaty, and they were actually in a surprisingly powerful position um, going into the Washington Naval Treaty. They'd been allowed to complete Nagato and Mutsu, and they had the Fuso and Ise classes plus the Congo, so they actually already had a force of 10 modern warships. At the time, with the exception of the Hood, you could make a reasonable argument to say that the Congo class were probably the most powerful battle cruisers in the world. Uh, the Americans didn't have any, and the British had Hood, renowned Repulse, and by the time the treaty was all said and done, Tiger. But until Renown and Repulse had had their 9-inch armour belts fitted, and having only six guns compared to the Congo's 814s, um, 
there, you could reasonably say that at that point the Congo class may have been superior to Renown and Repulse and uh, probably definitely superior to Tiger, although Tiger itself was a pretty good ship. And then when you look at the battleships, the uh, the Fuso and Issei classes have the same number of guns as the latest American standards, um, and similar to those standards, um, they have more numerous, albeit slightly smaller guns, than the Queen Elizabeth's. Their ships, the Japanese ships, are faster than the standards. Not quite as fast as the Queen Elizabeth's, but faster than the Revenge's. And the Nagatos have a similar armament caliber-wise to the Colorado's. Yes, the Nelson class are building, and the Nelson class are superior, but uh, that's all for the future. So overall, Japan could actually look at their ships, uh, as far as they were limited to their 10 ships, and go, well, actually, we've got a pretty decent navy here. Um, and no one else can upgrade their ships um, much, apart from obviously the British building the Nelsons. Um, so why should we bother building more ships? Uh, we can save the money and use it elsewhere, and they needed to. Now, by the time the designs that you're specifically talking about came around, um, which was sort of the late 1920s, early 1930s, it was a case, again, of, well, no one else is building new ships. so. Uh, we can make up designs. I mean, the British and Americans made up designs at the same time, but no one actually really started on actually building any new ships, so it kind of all went on hold, and then obviously by the time everyone was rearming uh, towards the mid-1930s, the Japanese have moved on to just going, you know, what stuff the treaties were building, the Yamatos. Now, as per for the designs that you specifically linked in the comment, which is more about the Congo replacement designs, well, yeah, they've got 160,000 horsepower. It could be done with 1930s boilers um, in a reasonable space. Um, the gun armament is a bit ambitious, um, but the, I think the main thing which possibly people forget with the Japanese designs is that when you look at the 1920 ships that got cancelled, like the Amagi, Ki, and Tosa, um, and even the number 13, they... Japanese fleet went for speed above armour. You compare, well, ignoring the Lexingtons for a minute, because Lexington, um, but if you look at the British designs and the South Dakota class 1920s design, those ships were designed ostensibly with armour to withstand their own main batteries. The Japanese ships were not. The Japanese ships went for uh, fire, lots of firepower, lots of speed, um, but they actually cut their armour down to significantly below what everyone else was going for, basically to have a tactically faster fleet. So I would suspect that what you will probably find um, with these designs is that the Japanese were probably thinking along similar lines of having uh, a lot of guns, a lot of speed, and then squeezing it all into a 35,000 tonne hull by basically having inadequate armour, effectively, uh, for at least what we would consider um, proper battleship protection. But also, as you mentioned in your full comment, this is right around the time of uh, the lightly built Megami problems, so it's also, in, it's also possible that such a design, when built, would have ended up being a fast, heavily armed battleship, I guess, because it's not as fast as a battlecruiser, but could have had significant problems both with just general protection and overall being too lightly built for its size. And given the problems they had with the Megami and some of their destroyers, those problems on battleship scale could have been rather interesting, shall we say. And uh, John69366 says, Why were the French pre dreadnought warships or anything before World War I looking so weird, like they stuck a castle on the ship or something? They do look cool but I get this steampunk vibe to it. Well, the short answer to that is French. Um, sorry, and that's not just me being, being English. That is basically what almost every major historian looking at them has just gone. They've gone, yeah, French. Um, the French didn't believe that much in classes of ship. They built, they believed in artisan handcrafted ships. Um, I mean, literally... Even ships that were ostensibly of the same class, it was kind of like, well, here's a design um, of various shipyards that we're awarding the contracts to mainly because of political pressure from your various representatives. 
we kind of appreciate it if you came out with something that at least vaguely resembled what we gave you on paper. So you would end up with ships, as I say, which were ostensibly of the same class, but actually were completely um, not interdependent in any way, shape or form, um, and had all sorts of weird and wonderful uh, eccentricities and extra bits of machinery tucked in and things taken off and different sizes and calibers of things stuck on all over the place. Um, usually, ba basically, the, the stuff that was provided by the central French government, like the main battery guns, were pretty much the only things that were standard between them. And the other thing was that the French did have a rather different idea of how naval battles would be fought between capital ships and how they should be used. So um, whereas most people went for uh, four guns in three twin turrets, the French would go for things like, say, four guns in four single turrets. Um, the superstructure, to be honest, was in part because of their pronounced tumble home, i.e. The, the narrowing of the hull the higher up above the water it goes, which restricted the amount of space and volume inside the hull, obviously, which meant they then needed to compensate for that above the hull in the superstructure because the space requirements on battleships don't really change that much just because you've changed the hull shape. Um, people still need to live there, for example. Um, and so, yeah, they, they, it was a basically just completely different design philosophy. And, uh, well, I guess the Battle of Tsushima kind of showed which design philosophy was superior there. If you want to put it into sort of modern computer gaming terms, you could almost say the French followed a different tech tree um, in a lot of their warship designs. So switching over to the Discord channel questions, uh, the Great King asks uh, if, I could elaborate on the capabilities of the King George V classes, guns and shells, and also how effective the ship would have been if it had used one of the initial design armaments of 15-inch guns. Well, again, going in reverse order, because that apparently is a thing that I like to do, um, if the ships had been designed with the modernised 15-inch uh, guns in three triple turrets, I think the ships probably would have been a lot more combat effective. I mean, certainly you would have ha had fewer issues um, with the turrets, I suspect. So things like Prince of Wales armament not really being that much up to snuff uh, in its fight with the Bismarck and constantly breaking down, as well as the perennial issues they just had with that quad design for ages. Um, those would have been avoided. I think it would have been a much easier time. The British were very familiar with a 15-inch gun. Albeit obviously, this would have been a new one and uh, triple turrets, albeit they didn't have that many of them, but they had worked out pretty much mo all the issues with triple turrets in the Nelson class. Given the accuracy of the 14-inch gun that was eventually used, and the fact that the 15-inch gun probably would have used similar design principles, it would have probably ended up being a worthy successor to the old 15-inch 42, with maybe sort of a 10-15% to 15 improvement in penetration um, at similar ranges, which would have been quite welcome. And when you compare that to the 14-inch guns, I mean, the 14-inch guns were very good guns for what they were, but uh, at least in terms of uh, penetration and um, reliability issues aside, the, it did leave the British with a slight fact that penetration-wise at range, their older Queen Elizabeth and Revenge-class ships actually were superior to uh, the King George V's 14-inch guns. So it would have been nice to have... Um, their more, more modern capital ships actually also having the superior firepower with the 15 inch. I suppose the flip side to that argument would probably be that, well, at the kind of battle ranges that were actually fought at, the armor penetration was adequate, but really when, you, when you're talking about, well, it's adequate, it's good enough, it's not really the world's greatest advertisement, is it? So yeah, um... As far as the capabilities of the actual guns themselves, well, as we mentioned, uh, their reliability wasn't fantastic, albeit that was more to do with the ammunition handling systems and actually getting the stuff to the uh, to the guns, although the guns themselves did tend to jam as well. It's just the, the quad turret, it never really worked. They solved a lot of the problems, but when, uh, I mean, you compare Prince of Wales and King George V's problems uh, against Bismarck versus uh, Duke of York versus Scharnhorst, Duke of York performed a hell of a lot better and showed that the gun itself as a as a ballistic thrower of projectiles was superbly accurate um but even in that engagement duke of york was still having problems with its ammunition supply system 
Um, it was just fortunate that even re regardless of that, it still overwhelmed the Scharnhorst. As I mentioned earlier, the penetration was slightly below that of the 15-inch 42. But on the flip side, and something that might explain why the gun seemed to do so relatively well against targets like Bismarck and Scharnhorst um, and other uh, various uh, victims that, that were fired at by, by these guns, is the fact that the shells carried a bursting charge that was well in excess of effectively anybody else's. Um, British ships in general, uh, their AP shells seem to carry much heavier bursting charges, and uh, believe it or not, for a, even though it's a 14-inch shell, um, when that 14-inch shell hits, it's actually carrying a 22 kilo explosive charge, which means that anybody else's 16 and 15-inch guns, so Bismarck, Latorio, Iowa, South Dakota, Nagato, all of those shells, fantastic as it might sound, actually carry less explosive firepower than King George V shells. I mean, most of the, those other shells I listed are more likely to penetrate you at longer ranges, but if you're fighting in a ship with thinner armour, or you're fighting at a range that's close enough, which you're probably talking about maybe 15, 16,000 yards or less, where that doesn't matter, or if the shell's hitting in a place where armour is not so much uh, the issue with things like maybe that forward hit on the Bismarck or hitting the superstructure or above the armor, um, messing up secondaries, that kind of thing, the British shell's actually going to do more damage um, because of that greater amount of explosive, basically. It might be a physically smaller shell, but there is a lot more energy going into the fragments that are produced and obviously the more explo explosion period. Um, so the damage outside of armour penetration or the damage inside a ship, assuming the shell gets into the armour, is going to be considerable, and I think that's probably what ramps up the shell's effectiveness. Avatar73 asks, Can you please tell us what the small guns on either side of the Richelieu's main turret is? Well, believe it or not, these are actually 37mm anti-aircraft guns, specifically the Model 1925 single version. Um, originally the French planned to put six of these things on the bat on this battleship, um, as it was basically a carryover from the Dunkirk class. In the event of actual war, they basically replaced them with much more efficient um, guns once they got a chance to. Um, but yeah, it's it's a weird little position to put an anti-aircraft gun on, and it's a very small detail that you basically you need to play something like World of Warships or even be able to zoom in to see, because in even high-res photos, they're such a small part of the overall battleship's armament. But there you go, that's what it is. Schwarthog says, uh, What if the Marine Nationale decided to continue the fight after surrender? What kind of impact could the French naval forces have had on the war? Well, this is a little bit of a fun scenario to imagine, and I mean, it's entirely plausible that they could have done so if they'd wanted to. I mean, well, okay, fair enough, the Greek Navy wasn't anywhere near as large uh, or as vital to German strategic interests as the French one, but under the terms of the uh, Greek surrender to the Germans in uh, the middle part of the Second World War, they were still told they had to hand over their armed forces including their navy and basically any greek ship that could sail stuck two fingers up at the germans and said yeah try and make us buy and off they went to join the royal navy and continue the fight so yeah in this scenario let's imagine the uh, french navy just decides to do the same things like yep yeah, whatever mate we're off so you have an incomplete richelieu although only just um and a rather more incomplete jean bar plus dunkirk and Strasbourg plus uh, the Britannia class, and even a couple of the Corbairs. You've also got a bunch of light and heavy cruisers of, to be honest, some questionable value, apart from Algerie, and you have a bunch of uh, submarines, torpedo boats, and destroyers, including the those wonderful, incredibly fast French destroyers. So, going in order of usefulness, um, the light and heavy cruiser is probably not quite as useful as one might otherwise imagine. Um, 
probably get sent to the Mediterranean fleet to help there because, let's face it, a lot of the Italian cruisers weren't particularly up to much either, um, and their speed would help greatly in hunting them down because, let's face it, actually the French and Italian navies were basically built to counter each other an awful lot. The older battleships, um, the Corbets, uh, maybe convoy escort duty, that's probably about the best use I can see for them, or bombardment, probably basically whatever you see the R-Class doing in World War II, probably would, the Corbets would be doing that as well. Um, the Britannia's probably, again, uh, more convoy escort, probably means things like uh, Nelson and Rodney don't get used for convoy escort anywhere near as much. Uh, which will free them up to be more active for um, other more offensive uses. The four modern French capital ships, so Dunkirk, Strasbourg, Richelieu, and Jean Bar, those are going to be near enough a godsend for the Royal Navy. And, I mean, the submarines are, are going to help as well, but let's face it, there were never that many submarine targets for the for, in the European theatre. The destroyers as well are going to be very welcome. I mean, to be honest, I can see pretty much most of the French fleet, assuming it does this, is probably winding up in the Mediterranean helping out over there because, as I said before, basically most of the French fleet was built to counter the Italian fleet and that's where the Italian fleet was. So, happy days. They get to fight the people they were supposed to be fighting and everyone works out uh, nice and joyful. Except for the Italians, of course, you probably get shot a lot. Now, as for the big French capital ships... Um, Richelieu should be fairly easy to complete, uh, at least refit with uh, various weapons to replace the ones it doesn't have. Um, Jean Bar, on the other hand, is going to be a little bit more of a problem considering it doesn't have most of its main armament. Um, possible sideways scenario, given that the British in the end did cobble Vanguard together out of uh, effectively spare parts. Um, Given that Jean Bar was supposed to use 15-inch guns in the first place, maybe the British stick their spare 15-inch guns on the Jean Bar instead. That would be an interesting little uh, side note. Yeah, let's go with that. That'd be fun. So Dunkirk and Strasbourg, I can see the British keeping them around basically as long as Scharnhorst and Geneser now are around. The Wherever those two German ships are, the British will keep Dunkirk and Strasbourg uh, somewhere in the vicinity to help with taking them on. Uh, I don't see them really being sent to the Mediterranean because uh, the Italians don't have any ships that are quite uh, that sort of size in that size um, bracket for engagement. Their older ships with lighter guns of similar caliber are still battleships, and the British have plenty of uh, Rs and Queen, Queen Elizabeths to deal with those. So, with those two around Dunkirk and Strasbourg, then you might end up actually with something like, say, Admiral Scheer uh, on one of its raiding missions getting caught out by one of those on convoy escort duty since they're now available rather than um, beating up on poor old defen near enough defenseless armed merchant cruisers. Um, so, that's a potentially interesting scenario. The big one, which I suppose is going to depend on how quickly they can get uh, Richelieu complete, is things like Bismarck, um, and yeah, you could probably see that coming from a mile off, but hey, if you've got a big, fast battleship with eight 15-inch guns, and uh, another big, fast battleship with eight 15-inch guns is come sailing out, then why the hell not? It, it's, it can keep up with Hood and Prince of Wales. In fact, it can probably go faster than they can. Um, yeah, that... That would be a very, very interesting scenario to see. Um, maybe one or the other of the uh, two Richelieu's would be sent to the Mediterranean at some point. Who knows? But I suspect they'd probably be kept back in home waters and uh, might even actually have allowed Hood to go in for uh, refit since they have uh, a ship that can effectively replace it in the other line of battle. Um, so it might actually be Richelieu and... Uh, Prince of Wales going up against Bismarck and Prince Eugen and oh god have I opened up another alternate history barrage of questions probably so yeah overall would have been very very helpful wish they had done it um, for all sorts of reasons not least of which it would have meant I wouldn't have to go over and over Merz El Kabir every five minutes Nuclear Fun asks uh, one thing that keeps bugging me when I see HMS Nelson or the Miyoko why is the second turret the super firing one 
I suspect it's for very similar reasons on both ships, and that simply comes down to the fact that if you have three turrets in a line, you are never going to be able to get all three of them firing dead forwards unless you go front turret uh, at normal position, second turret super firing, and then third turret in a kind of super super firing position, a bit like the triple six inch turret that uh, Yamato had uh, behind its two 18 inch turrets at the front. And the problem there is dual in that you've got problem one, your barbette is now like long cat of barbettes, um, which is makes it very vulnerable to being hit and means you've got to heavily armor it all the way up. Uh, all your magazine, uh, all your uh, mag ammunition transportation is now very long, so you've added an awful lot of weight to the ship. And the second problem is you now have your big, heavy, sort of several hundred to low thousand ton turret really high up, which is going to make the ship a lot more unstable for a given layout. And of course you just put a bunch of big guns with massive blast waves right next to the bridge, which is probably not going to endear you to the command staff. And so you're left with basically a choice of which gun turret you make super firing. Well obviously the first gun turret position, you that's just stupid because you'd block off both of the other turrets. So which of uh, turret 2 and turret 3? And basically turret 2 makes a slightly more sense than turret 3 does and the reason for that is it doesn't it's not going to make any difference to the amount of forward firepower you can have but having the second turret super firing gives it absolutely fantastic arcs of fire um, whereas making the third turret super firing is going to restrict the arcs of fire of that turret somewhat because of obviously the superstructure that's right behind it it also means any shock problems with firing your guns over another turret are reduced because that super firing turret is only ever going to be firing over one turret rather than two. There's a marginal case that suggests that the second turret and barbette can also protect the third turret from incoming fire coming in from the front, although admittedly that is a bit of an edge case. And lastly, because it allows you to bring the forwardmost turret back just slightly further than the third turret super firing arrangement would allow uh, which will have a marginally weight saving effect on your ship design overall and with that we bring episode 15 to a close hope you all enjoyed it any further questions obviously down in the comments uh, any further expansions or alternate suggestions you want to give again feel free always like to uh, always like to favorite those comments so that we can continue the discussion and people can be educated more and on that note, I'm going to go and find some painkillers. Thanks very much.